a lot of information to present to you tonight, and um, in order to get through that, and also to make sure that we have a uh, full and, and robust discussion, what I have asked is that we hold all questions until the end, and then we will be collecting cards with questions so that we can make sure that everybody will get an answer to their question. So make sure that you put an email address or a phone number or a mail address in case we get a flurry of questions and we're not able to get to all of them tonight. I want to also just say a couple of things. The first is the reason that this was a invite only list is because as you can see we have a very small room. But we are going to make this presentation to uh, anybody in the community who wants it, starting with TNT groups and others. And if you have a particular group, a neighborhood watch or another group that has more than two people that meets and you'd like this to be presented to your group, you can contact us and we'll make sure that it uh, happens as well. Um, so with that, let me turn it over to um, Captain Trudell who is going to talk about some information related to uh, burglaries and crimes in the city Captain Our presentation tonight is going to be broken down into three parts. Uh, first, we're going to attempt to uh, define the problem for you folks of burglary issues uh, throughout the city. Uh, we're going to talk to you about what we uh, are doing and what we have done um, to address that problem. And then Chief Cecil is going to talk to you about some of the crime prevention tips. Okay, to get everybody on the same page with uh, our definition of what a burglary is, uh, we have it defined up here for you. This is uh, based on the FBI's Uniform Crime Reporting. It's also the New York State Penal Law. It's basically the unlawful entry of a structure with intent to commit a crime therein. Where things get confusing is that structure. It doesn't have to be a residence. It doesn't have to be an apartment. It doesn't have to be somebody's home. That structure can be any one of the other uh, five up here, a shed, a store, an office, a garage, or a storage unit. Um, those are all defined as burglary under the statute. What we're going to primarily discuss with you here today are the residential burglaries. I think that's what the, the focus is and why everybody's out here. But I just kind of want to give you a sense of the, uh, what a burglary is and, and uh, the difference between the two. Okay, uh, from November, I'm sorry, from January 1st through November 30th, um, there was a total of 1,773 burglaries reported in the city of Syracuse. To give you a sense of breakdown between residential and businesses, a very small portion, 17% of our burglaries are actually businesses. Um, the bulk of, of our burglaries, which is the 1,472, 83% of our burglaries in the city are residential. And to, get, uh, to further break that down, these are the, the, some of the types of burglaries we, uh, we track. We track whether that burglary was domestic related. 4% uh, of those were domestics. Those in, 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 in most every instance our um, victim knows the suspect. Uh, the suspect knows the victim. And uh, those are cleared relatively easily. 4% uh, are garage or shed burglaries. They'll speak for themselves. <coughs> we talk about vacant and we talk about occupied. And I just want to make sure there's a clear distinction here. Vacant burglaries is what we track as usually the, our copper thefts or our um, uh, metal thefts. Those are uh, burglaries where no one at all lives in the home. The home's been vacant. Uh, it's maybe boarded up or maybe not boarded up in some instances. They break in and they, and they steal the metal or they steal the copper out of there. That's vacant. Not to be confused with occupied, 12% um, of our burglaries, a uh, relatively small portion of those burglaries, but still a very serious offense. Somebody's at home the time the burglary takes place. So it's a residential burglary. Somebody's in the house either at night or during the day when uh, somebody enters to commit that crime they're in. So that means it's occupied 12%. And then another significant number that we'll talk about throughout this presentation is this unsecured number. 32% of our residential burglaries across the city are unsecured homes. Unsecured doors, unsecured windows, left unlocked, that sort of thing. Um, and I, I would venture to guess that that's probably a relatively low number. 32% of the victims out there admitted to us that their home was unsecured when we arrived. Um, I would gather that um, there's, a, there's a fraction or, or maybe a, a, a much larger percent that, that didn't want to tell us that. So 32% admitted the fact that that place was unsecured. So that's a, an important number. 
Okay, so throughout the presentation, we're going to break the city down into quadrants. Um, for you, those of you that live in the city, we broke it down into four. Northwest, Northeast, Southeast, and Southwest. And to give you a frame of reference, um, Northeast would be everything. Um, it says 691, that's 690. Everything north of 690 and east of 81. That's the Northeast. Southeast, everything south of 690 and east of 81. Southwest, um, pretty much the, the, the line here is going to be Fayette Street, downtown, and then the, the southern half of, or southern end of Burnett Park would be southwest. And then northwest would be the, the remainder there. So as we're going through the stats and you live in a portion of the city, you can kind of orient yourself to what the stats mean for your neighborhoods. Okay, a lot of information on this slide. What we, what we tried to do here is to show a three-year comparison um, year to date, January 1st through November 30th, for 2010, 2011, and 2012. And what I want to point out here um, are a couple of things. Um, you can see that um, north, uh, Northwest and Southeast have seen a 25 and 24% increase in burglaries. And the way we figured that out is we averaged 2010 and 2011 together, brought those two averages together, and then figured out the percent change or difference between 2012 and that average. So where we see our issues so far this year are the Northwest, the Southeast. You'll see that the Southwest went down 28% from where they were from that average, and the Northeast saw a 2% decrease. Another thing that I'd like to point out here are these year-to-date totals. Right in the middle, right here. Okay, for 2010, uh, we saw 2,047 burglaries for the same time frame in 2010. 2011, we had an excellent year. We saw 1,532 burglaries. And so far in 2012, we're at 1,773. So you can see we're up above 2011, but we haven't hit, quite hit that mark for 2010. Um, also, just as a point of reference, um, Onondaga County, you can see that information here, had a 19% increase for this time frame from 2012 to 2011. They're also seeing an uptick in their burglaries. As I mentioned, 2011 was an extremely good year for us. So we had a record low number of burglaries. And this slide kind of points that out. There's a lot of information on this one else also, but basically what we did is we took these seven cities, we looked at the UCR crime reports for those seven cities for five years to give you a sense of where other cities are with their burglaries. Um, we averaged the five years together and statistically we came up with a range. So for 2011 we would expect Syracuse's burglaries to fall between 1808 and 2091 based on the previous five years. The same way with Hartford, Bridgeport, Rochester and so on and so forth a high and a low range. Well, you can see for Syracuse that in 2011, our number actually fell at 1705, which was well below that 1808 range. The rest of the cities, most of them went above their high range, and in some cases, within. Just to give you a frame of reference, can we go back one slide, please? Just to give you a frame of reference as to what our 2011 number looks like. I'm not trying to say that we don't have a, uh, a burglary uptick in 2012. I'm just trying to give you a frame of reference with what 2011 will look like 2010 nationwide. Okay, what does this all mean? Uh, burglaries have fluctuated and we are seeing an increase. <coughs> Is this increase significant? It's significant if you're living in that southeast or northwest area that saw a 24 or 25% increase, but overall, statistically, it's within the norm. That means we have a problem? Yes, we absolutely still have a problem. Not minimizing that at all. And what have we done, or what are we doing to uh, combat that issue? If you can go to the next slide. We drilled down on the last four weeks of burglaries. Uh, we looked at the last month um, and what's been plaguing the city with burglaries for that time frame. Uh, the large map gives you the last four weeks of burglaries with uh, dots indicating which week those burglaries occurred in. And based on looking at the map, you can see, based just on the dots, you can see that we had our, our issues in uh, the southeast, which I'm sure everybody is aware of. Um, had a small uptick in the Tip Hill area. We continue to see some burglaries up in this northern uh, uh, 
I'm sorry, Lodi Pond Street area. And then more recently, we've seen this West Brighton, West Lafayette um, grouping here. We also broke down these burglaries. I should back up a second. We had 192 overall, and there are 163 or 85% of them are the residential burglaries that you see on this map. So that 192 includes all burglaries, and then you're just looking at residential burglaries on this map. When you look at the burglaries and break them down by type, again, it, it remains consistent. 15% or a small percent of, of our burglaries are businesses. 2% are chronic. That's about four of these burglaries where they've occurred two or three times at the same address. And I will point out that unsecured homes, again, for the last four weeks, 32% of them are unsecured. Another key uh, piece of information here is time frames. Uh, we break our burglaries basically by um, time of day to include uh, daytime, nighttime, and then if it falls within a range that we can't quite tell because it goes for so long, then it falls under the unknown. But for the last four weeks, predominantly, across all districts, that 7 o'clock in the morning to 5 o'clock at night time frame is where the issue is. Um, in some cases, it's quadruple. In other cases, it's doubled um, compared to the overnight burglaries. So it's definitely something that we keep in mind, and, and when we put details out there, time of day, it's when you folks are at work or off to school. So basically what we did with this map is, this is a hot spot or density map. It takes all those dots, it looks at those dots, and where those dots are closest or more concentrated together, it makes that highest density, it makes it a higher density. And that's where you see this red as being high density. And then it, it uh, um, diffuses out or filters out into a lower density, which is the medium. So what we're showing on this map are those same areas that we saw, the dots, the high concentration of dots, overlaid with our arrests. So you can see the green stars are our juvenile arrests, and our black stars are going to be our adult arrests. And you can see by that number up there, 11 adults were arrested and 19 juvenile were arrested within that four week time frame. That's a complete reversal from what we typically see. We typically see a higher percentage of adults arrested for burglaries and a lower percentage of juveniles. But with this particular area right here, um, we have a, a strong juvenile problem which has bumped that number up. So a total of 19 juveniles, and predominantly, you can tell by the stars, predominantly the juveniles were arrested over in this area right here. You can also see um, this star was the, uh, the Danforth School incident over the weekend where we had three juveniles and one adult arrested. And then over on Tip Hill on Willis, we had an arrest last week um, of two individuals over there for a residential burglary. So we looked at that southeast area and we saw that majority of those arrests over in that area were juveniles. So what we wanted to do was pick out one of those juveniles um, that we could talk about and kind of give you a sense of this juvenile's involvement in criminal activity over in this area. And be mindful, this is one of approximately 12 or 13 <coughs> juveniles, excuse me, that were arrested in this area. So here we have Juvenile X, we can't give out the juvenile's name. Over the last four months, Juvenile X was arrested eight times and encountered by the police and documented in other incidents another eight times. So once a week for the last four months, the police has encountered this individual where we've had to arrest him or we've had to uh, document his involvement in a, in a criminal nature or a suspicious incident. And you can see that the white footprints of this juvenile are actually his arrests. And the green are his in police encounters, and they're all within this southeast distance. And I just want to reiterate that that's one juvenile of 12 or 13 juveniles that were plaguing that area over there. So it kind of gives you a sense of the arrests that we've done over the last four weeks, where those burglaries have occurred, and in particular, our juvenile issue. And to kind of further key in on that, it's just a this is just a, um, a zoomed in view of the same thing that we were explaining in the, in the last uh, slide. To give you a sense of what we're talking about, this is Salt Springs Road, this is Meadowbrook, 
Feedy and Sealy, just to give you a sense of where that juvenile was being arrested and being documented and being involved in something. Okay, so with that, I'd like to turn this over to uh, Lieutenant uh, Steve Barada from our Criminal Investigations Division. He'd like to talk to you about uh, our juvenile arrest processing at this point. My name is Lieutenant Steven Barada with the Criminal Investigations Division. I'm going to talk about juvenile arrest processing. Uh, first thing that I want to do is define what juvenile is. In New York State, a juvenile is anybody under 16 years old. Uh, I'll start off with classifying a juvenile offender. Juvenile offenders are persons aged 13 to 15 years old that, if arrested for any one of the following offenses, are charged as an adult. You've probably read in the paper where the police have arrested somebody and that person was charged as an adult. Well, that's not discretionary. There are certain crimes, if committed by people in these age groups, that if arrested, they will be arrested as an adult, processed as a fingerprinted and mugged. They will go to Hillbrook Detention Center, pending arraignment, Syracuse City Criminal Court. The matter is then in the hands of the district attorney's office. At that point, they can choose to proceed either in criminal court or kick it back to family court for action in family court. And again, the decision to kick it back to family court is not in our hands. Our arrest was made, they were arrested as an adult, and the decision at that point is on the district attorney's office. Juvenile offenders are persons 13 to 15, charged as an adult, age 13, murder second degree, ages 14 and 15. You can go ahead and read along. If we go to the next page, I'm not going to uh, read what's right in front of you here. But most importantly, when we get to the next page, is you'll see burglary first degree, burglary second degree. Well, here today we're talking about residential burglaries. And when you talk about an offense or a crime, oftentimes there's certain degrees. And within that degree, there are certain subsections that apply. So a residential burglary, generally, is going to be a burglary second degree. If there's other circumstances, including physical injury or weapons or things of that nature, it's clearly going to be upgraded to a burglary first. The person's a juvenile offender, right to Hillbrook, charges an adult. In the terms of burglary second, there's only one subsection that applies that makes this juvenile responsible as an adult. All other residential burglaries or burglary third degrees in the instance of a dwelling, they're going to be juvenile delinquents. A juvenile uh, delinquent. This is very important because this is what we're dealing with in this burglary second, this residential burglary uh, instant here. These are persons aged 7 to 16 who have committed an act that would constitute a crime if committed by an adult or is not criminally responsible for such conduct by reason of infancy or, as I mentioned earlier, the action is kicked back from criminal court back to family court in incidents of a juvenile offense, in which case they're going to be a juvenile delinquent. Now, here's the difference. It's the way we process these individuals that vary. In terms of a juvenile offender or an adult offender, we make an arrest. For an adult offender, if they're charged with any felony, with the exception of a select few Class E felonies, they're automatically brought to booking in the city of Syracuse pending the next arraignment, which is the following day. At that point, they're arraigned in front of a judge. They're either released or held on bail or held without any bail. And that's at the discretion of the judge or as presented by a district attorney's office. Uh, the same stands true for juvenile offenders. In terms of juvenile delinquents being the group of people that we're talking about, once arrested, the police officer needs to make a decision. That decision is either we release this person on an appearance ticket or we seek to have them temporarily detained at Hillbrook Detention Center pending arraignment in family court or we bring them directly to family court. Now what I want to emphasize here is bringing them to Hillbrook Detention Center is not placement, it's simply temporary detention. We pick somebody up tonight, if they meet a select uh, set of criteria, or if they pose a significant risk to the community, we'll seek to have them detained. They then go in front of a judge the following day at probably 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and again, they're either held or released. And that is at the discretion of the judge, and it is also the responsibility of the county's attorney office, the presenting agency in family court, to seek to have the person held, remanded, or released. Criteria that we use when arresting an individual is we look at the seriousness of the offense, the likelihood of the person imminently repeating the offense, and threats to public safety as a deciding factor and if we seek detention. On any juvenile that we seek to be brought to Hillbrook, we call up the Hillbrook Detention Center, uh, they go over certain background information with the juvenile, and there's a set instrument in place called a risk assessment instrument. If the juvenile scores out at a certain score, they're eligible to be detained 
they will be brought up there and again brought to court the following day. If they don't meet that numeric value and we feel that they're a risk to the community or that there's evidence to suggest that they are imminently going to repeat the offense, we would seek to have an override uh, with that request. We have a pretty good working relationship with the probation department and uh, we try to get these kids off the street and go in front of a judge. I'm not going to get into the uh, deciding factors that probation uses or what happens in family court. I'll turn that over to the Commissioner of Probation in uh, just a moment. If a person is issued an appearance ticket, they will be notified by the county to appear at a later date either in court or at the probation intake for an assessment. If they go to court, again, the judge makes a decision what happens to them, and if they're held at Hillbrook, they go to court the following day. Now, I want to stress that we're not looking to lock up every single juvenile, but we are looking to lock up or to temporarily detain our repeat offenders, and we really <coughs> seek to have them held overnight or short term because, you know, we have a concern about releasing them back to their environment. There's a reason these kids are making these decisions to break into houses, possess guns, whether it's an unsound structure in the home life, whether they're substance abusers, just making poor decisions. You know, we don't really know, and at 2 o'clock in the morning, it's difficult to really gauge that. So oftentimes, we'll seek an, uh, a placement, and again, temporarily. But as far as these juveniles being put away in a facility for a year or two years, that's beyond the arrest process, and perhaps the commissioner can fill us in on a little bit more. Uh, with that, I'll introduce uh, Commissioner uh, Shishman from the uh, Probation Department. Commissioner? Thank you. Thank you. Um, a couple things about the uh, juvenile justice system, because it does differ uh, so much from the criminal justice system. Uh, in New York State, the criminal justice system starts at age 16. Uh, juvenile justice, as I've just said, is significantly different than the criminal justice system. Family court judges can only detain if there's a substantial probability that the child will not appear in court or that there's a serious risk that the child will reoffend. And the sergeant was just talking a little bit about that. Thank you. That helps. Uh, Throughout family court, in the Family Court Act, throughout the whole thing, from arrest to placement, the focus is always on keeping the kids with their family, if at all possible. I really want to stress that, that that's a, a tenet of the Family Court Act, and it's through the whole process. Um, placements are as follows. For a misdemeanor, uh, 12, month, 12 months of placement. For a felony, 18 months. And that's it. Again, differs greatly from the uh, sentencing guidelines and, and what's available on the adult side. When a youth is arrested in the evening, and these are some of the things that the sergeant was just talking about, but I just want to reiterate them. Um, SPD calls Hillbrook to have the RAI completed. Now, that's our risk assessment instrument. The RAI score determines the recommendation. Depending on the, the, the score, the youth can be detained or released to one of our ATD programs. We have a couple of these programs, two of which are special supervision or um, EST, our EST program. Even if the youth does not score for detention on the RAI, an override can be requested, and the sergeant mentioned that, or he can be issued an appearance ticket. If arrested during the day, the youth can be taken to family court or issued an appearance ticket. Probation receives all juvenile appearance tickets. We then open a case in our intake unit. We do the, in the case of the appearance ticket coming to us, we uh, conduct an REI, we always conduct an REI, and we conduct other assessments, which are very important, not only in our juvenile work, but in our adult work as well. If the case needs to be petitioned, or, and this is important, if the victim insists on petition, we petition the case to court immediately. Keeping in mind, that means we will no longer be working with the youth. The, the case will be petitioned immediately to court. We try to divert cases, and that makes sense uh, on any number of levels, which if you have questions on, I can talk to you about that. But uh, m the majority of, of youth arrests uh, are, are diverted, and, and that makes sense, it makes sense to deal with them that way. If we can't divert them, then we refer them. Sometimes the family court, after we refer them, will send them back to us. That's called return for service. That happens occasionally as well. Even if we... Uh, petition a uh, case to court. There is no guarantee of placements. For instance, there might be proof problems, just as there is in the adult case, evidentiary issues. That's something that I think all of us would agree we want built into our, our system, whether it be for the juveniles or the adults. If a youth is placed on probation, he'll be placed with us for one year. If during that time he commits a serious offense, we'll file a violation of probation and return the case to court. 
while under probation supervision, uh, we also have access to many graduating sanctions, and I mentioned a few of those, including our enhanced supervision program and SSP, special supervision. We also have uh, the opportunity to put a youth on home confinement, what you might uh, think of as house arrest, while they're under probation supervision, if it's determined that that's necessary. Um, I would like to thank again the uh, SPD and the Mayor's Office uh, for inviting me here to speak. Uh, we have an excellent relationship with SPD, as, as the Sergeant mentioned. Um, we also have a, um, a steering committee that meets quarterly to discuss juvenile justice issues, and we have a, a wide range of, of folks on that, and, and, uh, and I view that as an excellent uh, collaborative effort. Um, the other thing, the only other thing I would say is um, we have seen, and I, and I don't say this proudly, I say this because um, it, it's an unfortunate thing, but we have seen an increase in our detention uh, over the past year. Um, I believe it's 30% increase in, in the detention. Now, we've worked hard to, to address that, and, and we will continue to do that, but sometimes uh, there are cases that need to be detained, and you can see that our, as I've just said, our detention numbers are are up. In addition, our placement numbers are up. Um, so I think that this is in response, obviously, to some of the stuff that we've seen over the past uh, eight months to a year, probably a year. Um, so that's that's some of the things to uh, to keep in mind. Okay, I'd like to introduce Chief Fowler. Thank you. And I want to talk to you about uh, the deployment of the police department just for a minute on a, on a broad scale. Yeah. The question has been raised as to whether we had enough police officers on the street or people are claiming that they don't see police officers out there. 91% of the police personnel that work here for the Syracuse Police Department work in what we refer to as an operations um, fashion. And, and uh, by operations I mean that they're working in one of these areas over here on this far side. Their job is to go out and either to investigate or to patrol, deter crime, or to uh, follow up on after the crime has been committed. This is a breakdown for our patrol area here, for patrol officers. As you can see, in 2009, we had 504 sworn police officers. Out of those, out of those 504 police officers we had, 241 of those were assigned to the patrol area. In 2012, we have 40, 468 police officers currently serving. A, a reduction of 7%. However, 246% of those officers are working in a patrol fashion, which is an incre increase of 4%. So we do have patrol officers out on the street. When We're very fortunate here in Onondaga County where we have a crime analysis center, which is right downstairs on the second floor. The Syracuse Police Department is a data-driven police officer. I mean, police department, a data-driven police department. We utilize data to point us in the direction of the problem. The problem is defined by the data that we collect through our arrests, uh, through crimes reported to us. That information comes into our crime analysis center. Once the information comes into our crime analysis center, they push the information out by way of crime data and intelligence. The crime data is defining the problem, where it is, what it looks like, and the intelligence is, is more specific who is likely committing these crimes, patterns of behavior that the detectives and the police officers can then act on. This information is, sent, is, is then directed through our um, commanders, our commanders and our operations supervisors and managers. We have two meetings here at the Syracuse Police Department. One of the meetings is the ComStat meeting. The ComStat meeting is where all of my commanding officers report out to me about various problems that they face within their districts, within the areas that they're responsible for, and we discuss them and we talk about ways to dedicate resources to the problems. Operations meeting. Operations meetings are held every week. That is the uh, supervisors and managers of all of these units over here too on the far side. They meet to talk about specific problems. And the problem that we're talking about tonight is, has indeed been a, a topic of discussion and, and how we'll go about addressing this problem tonight. With the patrol division, we're going to take an overt and a covert approach to it. And patrol, we're, because we had patrol officers, uh, uh, more patrol officers on the street, 
what we can, what the commanders can do periodically is to take uniform patrol officers and put them in a civilian <coughs> car, an unmarked car, and those cars will patrol the neighborhoods. Now, obviously, if a person is going to be committing a crime, when they when they see a marked unit, they're going to uh, um, either hide or adjust their behavior. But if they see an unmarked unit, they may you know, do do something to where the police officer they will draw the, their attention. And the police officers can make uh, uh, what we refer to as as a um, on view arrest of them. The criminal investigation division. The criminal investigation division not only is responsible for investigating the burglaries once they once they are committed, but they're also responsible for is to uh, is to put out details, burglary details. These are detectives that are specially trained and that have worked in the criminal investigations division and they know patterns of behavior, they're armed with the, info the intelligence information that's pushed out by the Crime Analysis Center and they know who they're looking for, they know what, what, what they're looking for, they know the neighborhoods in which these crimes are being committed and so we form special details through the Criminal Investigation Division in addition to the detectives doing their day-to-day -day business of investigating those crimes that have been committed. The Special Investigation Division this is our narcotics and our vice section. Well, these officers are out on the street anyway, um, doing narcotics investigations, vice investigations, and they're in these neighborhoods. And they're also armed with this information that comes out, the crime out of the Crime Analysis Center, Center. And by attending the operations meeting, they know that in addition to their daily duties of arresting the drug dealers and the prostitutes, that they they're, they're responsible for keeping a watchful eye out of out for patterns of behavior as it relates to burglaries or robberies or whatever the crime focus is. The crime reduction team. A crime reduction team is a is a, a very proactive group of um, of police officers. They work collectively as a team, and one of the things that they do is area saturation. There comes a period of time where we want to we want to flood the area with the number of police officers and, and there's a strategy that we have in place to, uh, as to why we would do that. We would use our crime reduction team to do just that. We have um, a, a number of police officers that we could dedicate to that without drawing down on our patrol resources because the patrol officers still have to respond to calls for police services on a daily basis. Our traffic division. The same thing. Our traffic division, in addition to answering your traffic complaints and being uh, proactive to addressing traffic concerns within the neighborhoods, they are also armed with this information from the Crime Analysis Center. And while they're doing their function as, as a traffic division, as, as a traffic unit, they're also responsible for keeping a watchful eye out. Now, uh, and also, we, we put the traffic division in some areas uh, also to... to um, conduct traffic stops, and they are a great source of, of police intelligence because by the traffic stops that, they, that they're that they doing, this gives us, a, this will tell us the people who are frequenting these areas. So in addition to the um, area saturations for traffic problems, we're learning, we're getting police intelligence that's going to help the criminal investigation division, the patrol division, and the crime analysis center and trying to figure out who are who, who, who are the people out here committing these crimes. The uh, community policing section. The community policing <coughs> section has community policing officers that work right, right in the districts each and every day. They're out on patrol. They also assist our school information resource officers. Those are the officers that work in the schools. The school information resource officers are part of the community policing section. Those school information resource officers, and when they're not extremely busy in the schools, they, they go out and patrol the neighborhoods. When school lets out, they're patrolling the neighborhoods within the community. They work in tandem with the community policing officers to patrol the areas uh, surrounding the schools. The community policing officers also um, engages in various forms of, uh, of education, educating the public on how to, um, uh, to, to, uh, not to, to make themselves a harder target to crimes, 
And, and at this point, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Deputy Chief Cecil. He's going to talk about the uh, education piece and how we can move toward uh, crime prevention and perhaps give you some tips to make your property a little uh, harder target. If I seem a little nervous up here, I'm not usually in front of the mayor and the chief, but well, the last time I was, I was in trouble. So, <laughs> <laughs> what I'm going to talk about, I can run that thing because I'm standing. Can everybody see me when I get behind the podium? Sometimes <laughs> 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 that's a problem, too. Uh, I'm go over this real quick because, in reality, I'm probably preaching to the choir here. All of your heads of Neighborhood Watch or other groups or community leaders, they've probably heard this stuff before. What I'm going to talk to you about is crime prevention, how you can make in particular, your house, a hard target for criminals. Because they look for the easy target. The crime triangle is a national uh, philosophy. There are three things that uh, uh, have to be in place for a crime. The desire, the ability, and the opportunity. As citizens, and even as the police, we don't, we don't do anything with desire or ability. If somebody has the desire and ability to commit a crime, they're going to try and find a way to do it. What we do work on, as, at the police department, and what you need to work on is, is citizens of the city, uh, homeowners, primarily again with burglaries, is to take away the opportunity. How do you do that? You, you establish various philosophies when you're leaving the house um, to, to uh, uh, address the, the potential that someone might try to find your house and look at your house to be an easy target. So you, you, you start working with these crime prevention tools to make your, your house a, um, a hard target. Again, you take away the opportunity, you take away any one of these three things and the crime cannot occur. We don't work on the desire or the ability, we work on the opportunity. And how do we do that with houses? You make your, your, your home a burglary hard target with these tips. And again, I'm going to go through these very quickly because I am preaching the choir and I'm sure you've heard all these before. Make your home always look occupied. Leave lights on when you go out. If you're going to, if you're going to be away for any length of time, connect some lamps to automatic timers during the line of the evening and, and on and off during the day. Again, you're trying to make your house look occupied. The suspects, the criminals that do this, do not want anyone to be home, for the most part, when they go uh, to look for a target. They want an empty house. Keep your garage door closed and locked. The reason for that is simple. Uh, if a criminal is driving down your street and you see something in that garage that he wants, chances are he's going to try to find an opportunity when you're not there to come back and get it. Lock all, the, lock all outside doors and windows before you leave the house or when you go to bed. Um, as we mentioned before, 32% of our burglaries have been unsecured homes. Uh, that's what the suspect is looking for. In most cases in this city, they are looking for an easy way in. If they find a house that's a hard target, it's not easy to get in, where they're going to have to make some noise and cause someone to wake up and, and spot them, they're going to move on to the next house. Some of the other tips, install adequate uh, exterior lighting. Motion sensitive lights are even, even better. They're the best thing you can possibly invest in other than a dog. Um, and I'll tell you why. We had a burglar suspect probably, well, it's probably 12 years going back now. That was a professional burglar. Um, he committed upwards of 50 to 60 burglars before we caught him. And one of his plea bargain, one of the things he did when he, when he went through the process, judicial process, is he sat down with us and he, and he spoke about how he picked his target. The very first thing he did was walk up the driveway, and if a motion light went on, he stopped and went to the next house. That was his very first thing. He didn't want to be in, he didn't want any lights. So if the light came on, moved on to the next house. Very important lighting. Trim the trees and shrubs to remove all hiding places for, for intruders. Uh, most windows can be pinned for security. You can go on any website and find out how to do that. If you have new windows, they already come with that pin. You just slip them out. It allows you to open the window, still get the air during the summer, but, but it only opens about this far. If you have the old windows in the old Victorian homes in the city of Syracuse, you just drill a hole and you put a nail in there. It doesn't do any damage to the window, but again, it allows it to open just slightly for air current. Uh, but doesn't allow the suspect to get in. Watch your neighbor's house and ask them to do the same. Call in suspicious activity. Don't assume someone else saw it and is going to make the call. You hear that quite frequently when you go to these neighborhood watch groups and a, and, a, and a crime has already occurred. We'll hear someone maybe met, we'll see, sometimes you hear somebody mention that they saw something suspicious, saw people walking down the street, looking up driveways, but they moved on down the street and they assumed somebody else down the, at the other end of the block was going to make the call. Don't ever assume that and make the call. Let us get there and see what we can find. And then the last, and you just need to organize. I put organizing here multiple times because that's what the suspect's looking for. There's a neighborhood that's not organized, that doesn't communicate, where they can walk around free, uh, looking up driveways, looking in garages, looking for windows that are open, uh, and things of that nature. Criminals avoid a neighborhood that is, a, that is on the lookout. 
and meet with your neighbors, find out who's home and awake. I mentioned this too. In any given neighborhood, there are people around. The police aren't ubiquitous. We're not everywhere all, all the time, but the neighbors are. You're, there's somebody in your neighborhood at all times. You get to know the neighbors, uh, as I'm sure all of you have. Again, I'm preaching to the choir here. Particularly when we mentioned how many burglars are occurring during the daytime. Find someone on your block that's there during the day and ask them if they could just keep an eye out up and down the street and out their back window for the, for the house that's behind them as well. Do the same thing for evening. A lot of people are home during the evening. And then for someone who perhaps works a strange shift and is up during the, the late hours so they can keep an eye on that neighborhood. And form a neighborhood watch group. Again, if you organize uh, the suspect, they, they will, will potentially take another neighborhood, uh, a neighborhood that's not organized. And once again, the police can't be everywhere at the same time. Um, for those of you who have filled out cards, if you could just hold them up and then we will collect them. Luke or Lindsay will collect them. Or if you have questions uh, that you've written on your, or you want to write a question, let us know. And uh, with that, we'll start going through some of the questions that we have already collected. So, <laughs> excuse me. Uh, what role do all of these pawn shops play in burglaries? Here's the first question. Now, um, we are working with the county to take that law and make it countywide. We have um, one pawn shop that moved just outside the city line and we believe that the reason they did that is because they didn't want to do the paperwork anymore and they knew if they were in Onondaga County just outside the city they didn't. So we have been and continue to and I think you got a sense of that as everybody came and talked. We work very closely with our partners from the county, very closely with our partners from probation, very closely with uh, the Onondaga County Executive's Office. This, what you got here is a snapshot in time. But what I want to share with you and, un and make sure that you understand is that we are doing this constantly, looking at information, deploying our resources where we need to, and also looking at other parts of the process and calling in and saying, we need your help or we need to fix this. So with that one individual, for example, the juvenile X, you saw they had 16 contacts with the police department. That's just one individual. And if you look at crime trends and statistics, what they all say is that you have a very small number of people committing a large number of crimes. And so what we are trying to do here is really focus on getting those individuals, getting them in the system, and making sure that we don't throw the key away, but trying to figure out alternatives and do things before they become a terror to the entire neighborhood. So that's why we work with our nonprofit, um, partners as well. We work with the Parks Department to expand programming. We're working with the school district to also make sure that kids are in school and not outside of school, which leads me to the next question. Frequently I see school-aged kids roaming up and down Court Street. If they are supposed to be in school and are not, what can be done to report this? Um, we can't always assume anymore that children of school age are supposed to be in school because there are lots of different reasons, as probation talked about, that they might not be in school. And so what I would caution you all is, don't think about this as children, think about this as suspicious activity. When you see people engage in suspicious activity, that's when you should call the police. Children riding a bike up and down a uh, court street isn't by itself suspicious. 12 and 13 year olds riding bikes up and down and looking in windows or uh, you know, carrying uh, blocks that look like they're going to be thrown into windows or casing driveways, that clearly is suspicious activity. And when you see that suspicious activity, that's when you should call the police and alert us right away. Our next question, uh, can we get back to precincts in the neighborhood? Let me... Um, answer this, I think that the chief talked about the fact that we have asked um, the Syracuse Police Department, and in fact all departments, to do more with less. It is no secret, and I hope it's no secret to any of you in this room, that we are under tremendous financial constraints. Despite that, I have said to every department, including our single largest department, the police department, that we have key services that we need to provide, and we need to figure out how to do that. And one of the commitments that the chief and I believe very strongly in is that the issue of patrols and having police officers in our neighborhoods is our priority. We want to make sure that we have more police officers in the streets, driving around, people are seeing them, and not in this building. 
and the Chief has made great strides in uh, doing that. Can we get back to a place where there are precincts? Financially, probably not. And also I would tell you as an organizational strategy, that doesn't make sense anymore. What we do was follow the model that's followed in New York City and Chicago and other Los Angeles, other places that have done great strides in um, curbing their crime, is taking our resources and putting it where our crime occurs. And so when we see crime spikes, as you've seen, or burglary spikes, in the southeast or in other neighborhoods, you will see more resources going there. Now, are you going to see more patrol officers or more patrol cars? Maybe, but you might not either because that might be the most effective way to catch these offenders. The second part of this question is sort of a more general question. What is the perceived root cause of the spike in crime? Economy, drugs, lack of education. Um, I'm going to answer this generally and tell you that all crime is irrational. Uh, and it is one of the most frustrating parts about living in a city. What makes, for example, a 13-year-old pick up a gun and shoot? What makes somebody decide to go into a house and steal a TV? There are all sorts of breakdowns, societal breakdowns, family breakdowns along the way that make people make irrational decisions. And so to stand up here and say that we can point to one factor, we can't. Crime has always been here. Crime will always be here. As the chief said with his, uh, his triangle, what we can do is look at the opportunity and minimize the opportunity for that crime to occur. And when we see that opportunity, make sure that when we have people who go through the system that we give them lots of alternatives to make sure that they don't end up victims of the system. Uh, how about the family court judges? Can family court judges give out tougher alternatives? Um, but another question was, what does probation do? And I think we had that answered. Um, what about programs like the Center for Community Alternatives? We did, <coughs> excuse me, we did not invite the family court judges here tonight, and did that deliberately. There is a very um, bright line between the legislature and the executive branch and the judiciary branch. To bring the family court judges here, to have them go through this presentation, would be to put them in a position that would get them in trouble with the, um, their superiors in Albany. That they are supposed to be impartial, and they are not supposed to be subject to this kind of what might be perceived as influence in this room. Now, we say that family court judges are members of our community. If you see them, you should feel free to talk to them about it. Do they pick up the paper and read about it? Are they part of the process with sentencing and other issues? Absolutely. But it needs to be a more formal, a more informal process than formal process. Uh, this question was about stepping up patrols. Um, and Chief, why don't you, I know you talked about it, but why don't you talk about the process that you go through with ComStat again so that people get a sense of how we make decisions about resource allocation when we get what we consider spikes in numbers and or uh, things that are unusual? Sure. Uh, once we identify a problem, one of the first things that we do is we step up the patrols in the area because the, the, first, the first line of defense or the first step in, in law enforcement is patrol. Police presence is the first level of, of enforcement. Any, and here's a great example of that. Is any of you in the audience, and, and I'm not going to write you a ticket for this, so free your raise your hand, all right? <laughs> Have any of you in the audience ever forget to fasten your seatbelt, and all of a sudden, three car lengths behind you, you see a patrol car <laughs> behind you, and the first thing you do is you take your fingers like Stretch Armstrong to cut to the curb, <laughs> grab the seatbelt, and try to fasten it before the police officers see you do it? That's, that's how that works. When you see a police car, 90% of us start to conform. We start to conform to the law. Make sure I'm not doing anything wrong and change our behavior. We realize that. That's the, that's the reason why we, we deploy our police officers like we do. We have a centralized police department. Our police officers report for duty. They go through roll call. They're given, given their information, and then they respond to their territories. We, over the years, have worked tirelessly to try to identify 
various ways to put resources right into the patrol vehicle. If I invite any of you, when you see a police officer that doesn't have a suspect stretched across the hood of the car or doesn't have a suspect pulled over, walk up to them and take a look inside the vehicle. There's all types of computers inside the, the vehicle, police radios, and, and a lot of information to keep those police officers right inside the vehicle so that they can do their job and they can remain in those neighborhoods because their presence there acts as a deterrent. Similar question, how can we get community neighbors and churches working together to begin solving the situation we have with our youth? We are doing that. The school district is here. The county, the probation office is here. We have nonprofits with our community development block grant in, um, in the city. We look at vulnerable populations and look to make sure that we provide programming. We're working with the superintendent, particularly on middle school students. Yes, sir. Did you have I live on the north side of Syracuse, specifically um, the area focused from Lurai to Padanade and all the way to the Cold Street and down um, that area. So my question is specifically focused on that area, like, and I have a question for you. What is the short-term plan to avoid the crime specifically focused on the north side of Syracuse? Like, I represent the immigrant, I'm immigrant, I'm very new to the United States, and I see a lot of people, they don't speak English, and they are very quickly attacked while they are working, while they are walking on the street, while they are going to the grocery store, and I have my bitter experience calling the police, they never came. Well, let me first answer that, and then I will um, ask the chief if he has to. I, I have met um, with the gentleman right to your left, Jai, about this very issue. There were two people in particular uh, that were targeting what we felt was the immigrant refugee community. Um, and one of them was a juvenile and one was not a juvenile. Uh, we have arrested the adult. Um, we took our resources and deployed them outside the um, school right next to uh, Holy Trinity, formerly known as Holy Trinity, to make sure that when people were leaving that school that they would see police officers there. We asked about what time some of these crimes were occurring. We made sure that we had increased patrols during that time. And also, we made sure that we offered to have a police officer come and do more prevention. So for example, one of the things that we found was with those kind of crimes in particular, crimes of opportunity, they feel like the um, immigrant refugee community are very vulnerable. And so if it's a one uh, immigrant or new American walking in our city, they're more likely to come up, push them down, grab their cell phone, grab their wallet. If it's more than one, they won't do that. So one of the first things we said is make sure that when you go to the grocery store, when you're leaving school, when you're walking home, that you're doing it together. They will not bother you in groups. One of the other things that we're doing is that we have two police officers, um, Officer Baru Zarian and Janan Salimovich, they work with CYO, Catholic Charities and Interfaith Works, and there's a, there's a fourth organization that they work with. And so when our immigrants and our refugees are coming into our country, they give them an orientation. As, and as a part of the orientation, there's a card that we came up with a few years ago, and it, and it has this information on it to say with, what country they're from, What language? <laughs> what language? <laughs> yeah. What language they speak, and we also have the phone numbers of some interpreters that speak that that language. Jai, can, Jai happens to be one of them. That's why he's helping me to answer this question. And so we went out into those communities, and, and we enlisted the services of people from those community communities to be our interpreters for a couple of reasons. Number one, they spoke the language, and then number two, they they may be familiar with the people that we're dealing with and, and that may en enable them to be a little bit more comfortable in dealing with the police. So we're that's some of the things that we are doing and that we have done and we will continue to work and to communicate with one another to make that process better. Uh, my question concerns the East University neighborhood. Is there a plan for the police to monitor this area over the uh, over the winter break? The concern is that most student rentals are, are empty for almost three weeks and they could become the prime target for burglaries. Not only could they become the prime target for burglaries, but we found, <coughs> speak for myself, in the years I've been mayor, that it is a prime target. And so what we have said to students is, make sure you either take your valuables home or lock your doors 
and take care of your windows. Again, a what is it that they say that say that my parents always say an ounce of prevention is worth you know pounds of whatever. So a little, uh, a little self help on your part in informing people to. You know, be particularly concerned. Has the city ever entertained a curfew? It seems like every year that I've been involved in city politics, um, there has been a curfew discussed. Um, it has, uh, there have been other cities in New York, Rochester in particular, that did uh, a curfew and it was knocked down. For um, a whole host of reasons, it doesn't make sense. Let me give you one in particular, which is the curfews are always at night. That's when people want curfews. Well, we find our crimes, as uh, Captain Trudell showed you, are occurring during the day. Uh, the second <coughs> issue is that in places where they have curfews, police officers end up becoming glorified babysitters. And we have real crime and real issues that we need our most skilled, our most highly paid civil servants to be doing. Um, as, uh, the, as the uh, gentleman for probation talked about, when you arrest these children sometimes at 2 or 3 in the morning, you can't figure out what the family structure is. If we were arresting all of them, we'd be spending all of our resources on trying to figure out what the family structure is, who, you know, where do these children belong, um, and we need our police officers making sure that we are chasing bad people through backyards, uh, eliminating shots fired, <coughs> stopping burglaries, investigating burglaries. Is there a way to create a database that can be used between probation, city, nonprofits who provide community service to juveniles to reinforce change and follow this person, follow these persons for progress for a year? Let me talk about the database. There is a database, a common database that is used between the government organizations. We have to be very careful when we have nonprofits or non-governmental organizations have access to this information because there are privacy rules and these are this is information that is protected by the law so we can't just give somebody a password to go in and check on um, individuals however we do share this information with nonprofits and we make sure that there is a system if we have contracts with them or frankly most often if they have contracts with the county of probation to give them the information they need so that we can ascertain whether this program is working whether it's only worked for a small percentage of children, whether it's worked for a large percentage of people, that's part of what we mean when we say we are a data-driven organization. That we are constantly looking to say, the money that we have is so precious and so small, we want to make sure that we are getting the biggest bang for the buck. And part of what that means is a program may be a great program run by great people, but if it's not effective or efficient, at curbing the behavior or changing behavior, we're not going to invest in it. Um, does taking away the opportunity for a crime being committed mean that we should do away with events that may draw children looking for and causing trouble? How do we remove the opportunity for something like a neighborhood carnival? We, in fact, we have just the, the opposite. We're looking to provide more opportunities for children to do things other than crime. So, let me give you an example. In certain neighborhoods, this is not popular, but there are certain neighborhoods which have asked the city to take down um, basketball hoops, and I have refused to do it. Because we want to make sure that children have the opportunity to do constructive activities like basketball. There are other neighborhoods that have asked me to say, you know what, there are children playing basketball in the street at 8 and 9 o'clock at night in the summer, probably not tonight. And can you come and uh, arrest them or tell them not to do it? And I've said, no, we're not going to. We have community centers that we fund. We have lots of programming that we do through the, the Parks Department. We have programming that we do through our other organizations. We're working closely with the school district. This is, the with Juvenile X, for example, that's the last chance for that juvenile. We're hoping that we have lots of different alternatives along the pathway to take that juvenile and make the, help them and their families or their support structure or lack thereof make better choices and other choices. And I believe that there are lots of things in the city, in, in our community, we just have to make sure that we intervene to take those children and put them um, in those places. Is there any chances of involving the community volunteer from different community to reduce the crime, especially focused on immigrant population? I will say to you that anybody who wants to help and volunteer in the city of Syracuse, we have a job for you. Um, and uh, it's not, the pay is not good, 
and the, there's not a lot of glamour, but it is very rewarding work. Is there any budget from the city to help the community policing center to avoid kids on the street? Um, part of that budget is uh, what we look at in the, in the police department, and part of what we have to balance when we look at that budget is people love to see a storefront presence by the police. We all love that. We all want that. But if that police officer is in that storefront, then they're not out in the neighborhoods driving around. So uh, that's something that we balance uh, year to year to determine. How many times does a juvenile have to be arrested before they are punished? I think you heard from the probation department and also our own police department that those kind of decisions are very fact specific and case specific to that juvenile. Um, but rest assured that we are asking that same question and making sure that others in the system understand what happens when you have somebody who is released, who committed 16 burglaries and is released within 24 hours and then go and commits another four. Uh, we are hearing that New York State is thinking about raising the juvenile, the age for a juvenile from 16 to 18. This will have a further negative impact on the crimes we are experiencing. What should we do to keep the age at 16? Um, this is news to me. Uh, the, so I'm being told it's true. The people who uh, write this law, write these laws, are your state legislators, and the um, you should talk to your state legislators about that. Simple act of locking your doors and making your property seem like it's going to be a slight hardship for somebody to break in, a juvenile will uh, combat a lot of this crime. So if people come out and say, well, what should, what's the lesson? You know, the lessons that you learn from this meeting, I think there are a whole bunch, including how we deploy resources, the kind of crime analysis that we use, how we data drives our decisions. But we all have responsibilities in this. I think, if I may, your responsibility is to communicate to people the simple act of locking up your house and, and taking care of your property will prevent a lot of that. Our responsibility is to make sure that we continue to work with our partners in government where we have identified these problems that are becoming chronic and these people who are kind of young people who are slipping through the system and as a consequence are really terrorizing neighborhoods, certain neighborhoods, um, and also to work with others to make sure that we uh, can move through this. Let me say, those of you who um, know me well know that I have an hour rule for a meeting and we've already gone over that hour. None of us are going anyplace and um, so we're going to be here. Happy to answer your questions. Uh, you can, those of you who want to have the police department come and do this presentation can talk to uh, anybody who looks official or you can email it to us or you can phone uh, any way you want. We'd be happy to do it um, and we will be here. Thank you all very much for being here tonight. I appreciate your time.